Well, thank you so much for having me. I have, uh, real, I'm really honored to have been invited, and I uh, really appreciate the invitation from the team here inviting me. I'll mention that I had the pleasure and um, uh, of learning a bit from Dr. Torrens, so it's particularly nice for me to be able to be here. Several years ago, I participated in a group of uh, lectures that he gave as one of his students and learned a lot about healthcare organization and healthcare finance, something that I had never learned in medical school or during my residency. So it was a, a very nice thing for me to be able to, um, to get to know him and uh, appreciate his gifts. Um, I thought that I would, what I would do in organizing my own thoughts f with you all was to think about emerging trends in, uh, that are affecting healthcare and are projected to affect healthcare in the future, and then think again about how those same trends may be affecting medical education. And I'd like to both go through the areas in which medical education is challenged and also tell you about some of the things that are going on here at UCLA uh, to, uh, to address some of those challenges. So we'll start with that first one, um, aging and growing populations. And I'll speak first about the challenges in medical education, just a few of them, and highlight those and then some opportunities that we've taken advantage of here at UCLA and beyond. Uh, so starting first, the, the aging and growing population um, trend is um, bringing up a number of challenges about the physician workforce. As you can see there, I've mentioned that, the, that there's a projected shortfall. The AAMC is projecting that by 2025, uh, we'll have a shortfall of 67 to 95,000 physicians. And this is taking into account a maximum um, development of advanced practice nurses and physician's assistants who would be also in practice at that time. So pretty large projected shortfall. In addition, there's the known maldistribution that's been a problem for quite some time. And by that, I mean both the geographic maldistribution of where our physicians are practicing, but also maldistribution with respect to their choices of specialties. It's projected that there will be particular shortfalls in the areas of surgery, uh, psychiatry and in primary care in 2025. Um, physician well-being is up there and it may seem a bit strange to think about that when we're thinking about an aging and growing population, but there's two main things that I'll highlight that uh, Mary Sue actually also mentioned and that is that we're seeing a rising burnout rate or at least a an increase in the recognition of burnout. Uh, so burnout is now being measured at the 50% range now amongst practicing physicians and as high as 70% amongst residents. And obviously burnout can affect people's uh, longitudinal span in terms of their careers and may affect, again, physician, um, a physician influence a physician shortage. Um, the other area of well-being, very sad, and Mary Sue mentioned this, is uh, recognition of increasing physician suicide rate. In our nation, approximately 400 physicians die each year by suicide, the equivalent of a medical school class each year who are gone. And the rates for both men and women physicians are higher than age-matched cohorts. So all of those... Uh, obviously, we're caring about the physicians themselves, but this too has an influence on uh, physician, sh uh, the projected physician shortage. Finally, I put physician diversity up there because of the ongoing uh, challenges in uh, diversifying our physicians and ensuring that we have a group of physicians who are care taking good care of a very diverse patient population. The next challenge is related, and that is about whether or not we have the money to train physicians to go out and be part of the workforce. As you may know, the federal government has capped their support of graduate medical education since 1997. In other words, there are no more positions in the nation than there were in 1997 um, that are supported by the federal government. And state support has also been diminishing over the last 10 to 20 years. So the growth 
that has gone on in graduate medical education has been supported entirely by clinical revenue. And this can be then a vicious cycle because the physicians at the attending level who are working so hard to generate that revenue to support GME are less available to teach the residents because they're doing so much clinical care to support that, their, their positions. Finally, there's the imperative for us to continue to prepare physicians to not only provide health care to individuals who are sick, but also to learn and know much more about preventive care and the maintenance of population health. So what are we doing here at UCLA about all of these problems? Well, a big one Mary Sue mentioned before is the collaborative training for advanced practice nurses and physicians assistants. And that's going on not only here on this campus, but amongst our, um, our affiliate institutions as well. There's also a tremendous increase in community-based teaching, especially in the primary tracks here at UCLA amongst our residency programs. And this is intended to try to promote uh, careers in primary care as well as to place individuals in the communities where we hope that they'll continue to practice, especially those that are underserved. I'll speak briefly about my own department, pediatrics. Uh, the UCLA Department of Pediatrics Residency Program has the highest rate of graduates practicing in underserved areas of any PEDS program in the state. And uh, so it's just an indication of the commitment that I think we see across um, UCLA uh, for uh, really trying to um, promote primary care. Uh, we're also making major attempts to align what we do in GME with societal needs. An example is that we've just authorized in, um, and uh, we will begin a new addiction medicine fellowship training program under family medicine starting in 2018. This will complement the existing addiction psychiatry training that's already going on here at UCLA. And there's also a number of programs uh, with curricula that really focus on population health and social determinants of health, which uh, again, we'll, we hope will expand our residents um, preparation for the future. And then finally, with respect to physician diversity, um, there's a holistic review going on for admissions, both at the undergraduate medical education level, as well as at the graduate medical education level, and a big focus upon the learning environment and on equity within the learning environment. We're also, um, developing new programs to provide physician well-being. And there's a major program that just started this year for physicians in training, where both our medical students and our residents and fellows now have access to um, mental health services um, free of charge for them. And that's through the School of Medicine. And to hope that that same program can be expanded to the other health-related schools. With respect to the exponential growth of medical discovery, um, the in, the uh, challenges include increasing patient complexity, both in the inpatient arena and the outpatient arena, just as medicine becomes more and more complex. This, in some cases, de decreases resident autonomy and impacts resident learning, and it's something that we just need to be aware of. I'm not arguing against our uh, ongoing care for increasingly complex patients, but understanding what the resident role is in caring for uh, the very complex patient is one of the challenges that we're facing. There's also obviously an increased reliance on in both interdisciplinary and interprofessional teams. That's also a great thing, but with it comes the challenges of preparing physicians to know how to be team members in that setting, something relatively new for, for physicians. Um, concomitantly or relatedly, an increased emphasis on both quality improvement and patient safety, something that our nursing colleagues have really embraced, but is also being embraced more and more in the physician world. And, find, and, and in addition, um, a need to redefine roles and expectations, for example, helping um, physicians understand how to be co-managers in a world in which they are not the team leaders necessarily and that they're working in both those interdisciplinary and interprofessional teams. All of this extra information requires ongoing learning and a commitment to being able to keep up. And so another challenge for us is nurturing that lifelong commitment to learning and giving our 
train these tools to be able to do that. So what are we doing here? Well, you heard a bit about this. There's a lot of work in advancing both the interdisciplinary and interprofessional team-based education in the SIM lab, amongst our residency programs there, interprofessional team-based trainings in psychiatry, in uh, no, I'm sorry, not in psychiatry, in anesthesia, internal medicine, family medicine, pediatrics, OB, and neurosurgery. And there's also a number of patient safety initiatives and quality improvement education initiatives that are interdisciplinary, and has been, that's been a very um, important um, team-based activity for our residents and fellows to learn in those settings. Uh, Residents and fellows can't be taught new things without their faculty knowing how to teach them. So a lot of faculty development is going on in these areas at UCLA. And there's also a tremendous focus on professionalism promotion and what it means to be a professional in this time, including the um, adoption of something called the Patient Advocacy Reporting System. You may have heard about this as PARS for short. It's a program that was started at Vanderbilt. It has a tremendous evidence base in terms of being very effective in promoting both professionalism and increasing communication skills amongst physicians. And then with respect to lifelong learning and um, learning how to um, and, and maintaining skills in, term, in terms of keeping up a lot of team-based learning and evidence-based medicine training throughout our residency programs. Moving on to the increased reliance on technology, the challenges in medical education, one of the big, one is the big ones is the electronic medical record. So while this is a tremendous tool that's been very, very important and helpful, it also can lead to disruption of the doctor-patient relationship, and there's good evidence for that. There's also good evidence, evidence that it leads to significant physician dissatisfaction, um, maybe nurse dissatisfaction as well. I'll, can, I'll defer to Mary Sue on that one, but um, this also has been linked, at least in a speculative way, to physician burnout. Um, Care delivery systems are changing with home monitoring and telemedicine. There are all kinds of new places in which physicians, in which patients are being cared for. And this leads to challenges in terms of how do we train physicians to know how to care for patients in those settings. And then there are changing expectations of physician communication that patients have, including electronic communication. Um, also familiarity with new technology in the other disciplines. So in terms of what we're doing, lots of training in electronic health record use, including resident engagement in optimization of the electronic health record. It's a well-known fact, but maybe uh, somewhat hidden from the public, that virtually all of the users of the electronic health rec record at Reagan uh, at the physician level are residents. And so engaging them in that process is very important. Uh, expansion of training sites and experiences to include some of those new settings. Um, training and being compliant with electronic communication with patients is a very important thing for the future. Interprofessional team training we talked about before. And then changes in societal expectations. One of the big changes in graduate medical education in the last five to 10 years has been this shift towards the competency-based medical education focus uh, away from judging the quality of a training program by an assessment of the curriculum and more towards judging the quality of the training program by looking at the outcomes of the residents, of the competencies of the residents themselves. So in addition to the traditional patient care and medical knowledge training, incorporating those area, other areas of training. Patient-centered care um, is also societal expectations for which we need to uh, prepare our residents in, in the ways that are listed there. And so we are doing faculty development again. UCLA is going to be an ACGME regional site for faculty development on resident assessment. And we will be offering that assessment to the Western region. And we're providing training in our residency programs in all of these areas. So in the future, Physicians have to provide the things they've always provided and those things that we expected them to do, but they also need to continue to, they need to have an added focus on systems thinking, on population health, on health equity, continuous improvement, the interprofessional collaboration that we've spoken about, and continuous learning. So thank you. Thank you.